I'm very happy now that we have a almost historic session. Um, 20 years ago, you would have said this is a historic session when in, in Reykjavik, East and West came together. Mr. Gorbachev and Mr. Reagan speaking about the future of the world. Now we have basically the equivalent of, Mr. of the two statesmen in investment business, in venture capital, Mr. Milner and Mr. Breyer speaking to us <laughs> on investing. And um, before we call them on stage um, and we thought, David, you, I call you on stage. Uh, <laughs> because you will moderate the session I again. Oh, okay. So tell me who will start, actually. We're going to start with Jim Breyer yeah. for a little while. I'll talk to him. And then instead of doing Yuri Milner separately, yeah. you, Mike? Um, I think you just work there. Do I do here? Okay. Instead of doing Yuri Milner separately, we decided since they're both so involved in Facebook um, and they're the number one and number two institutional holders in Facebook, it might be interesting to talk to them together. There's things to talk to them both about more broadly, so we'll do a little bit of that individually, and then we'll talk together mostly about Facebook and whatever anybody in the audience wants to ask about. I think that's very interesting, and so because you write this book about Facebook, you know both, and Randy will sing later, so yeah, that's, that's our Randy traditional sort of Facebook. Top it off, I guess. That's, that's our nice. traditional Facebook moment at okay. DLD. But now, seriously, um, both represent, both are one of the most successful investors, actually. Um, Right. Both sides. Well, Jim, and so, yeah. Jim, maybe introduce Jim and, and also uh, Yuri to us, who so, they oh, are. Introduce them now. Well, Jim, Jim Breyer was just voted uh, the number, the top best VC in the Tech, the Crunchy Awards recently. He's had an amazing few years. Really, uh, uh, I think the, the investment in Facebook back in early '05 kind of was a pretty landmark experience for Excel, and 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 he's now done a huge number of very innovative things. Uh, which we're going to talk to him about in social media and elsewhere. He's on the board of Walmart. He's the lead outside director at Walmart, which really flowed partly from Excel and Walmart back in the day, jointly creating Walmart.com. Um, but he's been one of the top you know, outside advisors to Walmart for a long time. He's now on the board of Dell also. So Jim has like, one foot in the giant old uh, industry and, uh, and and probably his his bigger foot in the new media, but he straddles a lot of worlds and he has great perspective because of that. So that's Jim. Then Yuri Milner, uh, we're going to have to hear him explain a lot of, about how he got to where he is today. But he's a Moscow-based investor, runs an investment firm called Digital Sky Technologies. Is it Technologies or Technology? Whatever. Okay, but it's Digital Sky, and. Um, <clears throat> He's become one of the world's leading investors in social media, and he is now the second largest investor in Facebook from the outside. Uh, and aside from one or two insiders, including Zuckerberg, these two are the two biggest investors in Facebook. Um, and so that's enough. That's cool. So um, we call on stage, and that's your floor. And we enjoyed the next session. And a big applause to Jim Breyer. Hey. I think Digital Sky Technologies is a much more interesting name than Axel Partners. I would say it is. Yuri, yeah. can we be Digital Sky US? <laughs> I don't think my mic is on. Or is it? Oh, yeah. So, so just to start out to try to kind of warm things up, let's talk about venture capital here. Since you are, you know, VC of the year, um, you know, the, the venture capital industry seems to me had a kind of rough period in a certain sense in that, you know, what we've now entered into is a period where startups don't, especially digital media startups, internet startups, don't need as much money to get going with so many other factors that are out there with, with, uh, with open source and uh, services available from Amazon and others that allow them to get started with very little capital investment. So how do you see the, the VC landscape, particularly as it relates to internet companies right now? Well, I think that there will be half as many firms and half as many venture capitalists five years from now when we return to this conference uh, as we have today. And I really do think that the shakeout that most people spoke about in 2000, 2001, uh, which was certainly a painful time for all of us in the business, uh, it never really occurred because venture capital is a business where there are very few barriers to entry. Uh, but once you're in, there are uh, quite a few barriers to exit, if you will. 
and we've seen a continuing increase in venture capital worldwide uh, over the last decade. The big difference with the crash of 2008 and the earlier crashes was that our limited partners, who tend to be wealthy individuals, pension funds, endowments, family foundations, all saw their net worth clipped at about 30%. Uh, in addition, they face a liquidity squeeze. And my guess is that venture capital fundraising over the next year or two uh, will drop dramatically. And that's probably a good thing. Uh, it's also a good thing for entrepreneurs because I think our business uh, is predicated on a great deal of segmentation and focus. There needs to be much more creativity than typically doing the, the Me Too internet project. And so I expect it to be quite a difficult couple years for the venture business. Uh, in the U.S. again, I think there are enormous opportunities globally. And that's where uh, if I was a coming out of school venture capitalist today, I would be on a plane to London, Beijing, or Bangalore and not necessarily Palo Alto, California. But, but why is it good for entrepreneurs that there's going to be a smaller VC industry? I don't understand that. I think there's enough demand uh, always in the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem, if you will, so that there is always a great deal of capital available. And so if the venture capital business shrinks by 50%, there are angel investors, there are other forms of financing, and for really good entrepreneurs, they will find ways right. to get funding. On the other hand, uh, why it's really positive for most entrepreneurs, and I see many of our entrepreneurs in the audience, what typically has happened in big boom times, such as the late 90s, a innovative, original entrepreneur may have founded a business, and lo and behold, six months later, there were five or six other businesses which were almost identical that were funded by venture capitalists. That's just not happening the way it was, and that's why it's really good, both for venture capitalists and entrepreneurs, to have a declining supply of venture capital. So that was never healthy in your mind? Oh, that was never healthy. Yeah. Uh, there was a time in our business where if you were first in with a great entrepreneur in a really innovative space, you knew that if we built the right technology and the right team, you could make a very nice return on the business. In the late 90s, and at times today in certain segments, which we consider to be overpopulated, uh, if there are five or six other companies being formed which are not as distinctive, uh, how many of those companies can you sell to Google or Microsoft or Cisco? And certainly, you can't take a lot of those companies public. So the fewer financings done in deeply strategic areas, the better for the entrepreneurs, the better for the venture capitalists. So what are some overpopulated sectors right now, in your opinion? Well, they, some of the overpopulated segments are some of the most interesting from a long-term point of view, but I really do espouse the view that when something becomes very much in the mainstream, uh, there is a dynamic in the private markets where the deals get priced to perfection. And those are not typically the deals that you want to do. I think our view, as you know, David, is let's think about a prepared mind thesis where we're trying to use, uh, for lack of a better phrase, better radar, and three to five years out, try to assess what are the big breakout opportunities. And in the mid-decade, uh, 2004, 2005, uh, our prepare mind thesis was very much around what social networks might look like, and then it took a couple years to find what we hoped would be the right social network. And then we started to double down and get more aggressive about other social apps, whether it was Playfish, which my partners in London initiated. Uh, we have a company, Etsy, in the social commerce space, which we believe is one of the most interesting upside opportunities. Uh, and meanwhile, through the great efforts of uh, Mike Schrepp, uh, our lead engineer at Facebook, uh, and many others, we're trying to build a platform and an ecosystem around Facebook Connect and Facebook Platform and really get it right so that our portfolio companies, as well as other startups, can run their businesses effectively 
with very clear terms of service and make a big bet that Facebook as a platform will allow them to innovate and build very significant businesses. Okay, before we get too deep into Facebook, though, you, you've got this prepared mind initiative sort of philosophy at Excel. You talked about what some of the, the, the thought, thinking was in, the, in 2004. What are your prepared mind initiatives right now? We typically have three to five prepared mind initiatives. And one of them certainly now is led by my partner in the audience here, Rich Wong, who has really driven our mobile and, and wireless data efforts. Rich has been fantastic. And Rich's first deal uh, was actually AdMob, which is currently in the process of being sold to Google for $750 million. And Rich quarterbacked that deal and identified the mobile ad space as something that would be very significant. Rich continues to lead our mobile and wireless prepared mind initiatives. And we believe companies like Foursquare and other companies that are addressing some very innovative check-in opportunities uh, provide some real upside. Uh, another area which I certainly spend lots of time with uh, from the Walmart side as well as the Etsy side would be the social commerce space. Uh, one can think of uh, obviously a tremendous company like Amazon. It was all based around product. eBay, all based around product. Great companies, especially Amazon. Uh, my view and our view at Axel is there is a new set of companies that are going to be a tr really using the social networks and the social graph to provide one-to-one -one people recommendations around commerce. And so David based Kirkpatrick... Based on your friendships and whatever. Based on the friendships. So David Kirkpatrick likes Neil Young. And I believe there Which is... Which he knows I do, but... Anyway. And there is some great Neil Young memorabilia out there. Uh, I am not necessarily going to try to find that on Amazon or eBay. I would want to see what does David Kirkpatrick think of this 1969 concert uh, photo of Neil Young uh, and go to people I perceive as experts in particular categories. Uh, I have such a fervent belief that social commerce is going to provide phenomenal opportunities that not only companies like Etsy and other investments we're making will drive some of this, but Walmart, I believe, will be uh, spending tens of millions of dollars this year and more next year, both on the dot-com dot side and the physical world store side, to start to address many of these social commerce opportunities so that five years from now, the world in terms of commerce will look as different then as what Amazon and eBay did in yeah, their inception. Yeah, so hold on, because I want to hear whatever other initiatives you have, but how will Walmart do it in the physical stores? That's a kind of a surprising idea. Using some kind of mobile device? That'll, how, how is that going to happen? A absolutely. And we're not there yet. I think we you, we well, view... social commerce barely exists now. I mean, Etsy is an example, but there are very few examples of operational social commerce today. Absolutely. Right? Like, I can hardly think of any others. I mean, absolutely. We're seeing at Facebook some even very Etsy's innovative really not, third parties. No, no, I would say Etsy's It's, it's moving in the right commerce. direction, yeah, yeah. We're not executing quite as quickly as Albert, I, and others would like, but you'll see a big positive change there, and it's growing very nicely. But with Walmart, the web is as integral to its long-term merchandising strategy as super centers or new formats or what we might be doing in Russia. Uh, we also learn from our failures, and this is the country where Walmart failed uh, most prolifically. Germany ended up being extremely difficult, and we pulled out. But with social commerce and Walmart, think of walking into a store, and with your mobile device, you're walking through the traditional audio and video and electronics department, you're looking at TVs, you don't want the Walmart associate recommending a TV uh, or a Best Buy, wherever you might be. What you want, again, is if Peter Hirschberg or Samir or someone who really knows TVs uh, is available by phone, by web browser, whatever it might be, to very quickly get the recommendations from your friends around which phones, which commerce, which devices might be most interesting, and suddenly you've tapped into deep knowledge 
from people you trust, and that's where I see a lot of the commerce going. But if you're in the store in Walmart, where's that information coming from? Through your iPhone, through your social web, your through mobile web. Through a Facebook web. Connect integration, theoretically, or what? It could be through your Facebook Connect integration. It could be through uh, an application on Facebook uh, where you might be accessing it in the store uh, from a, uh, a netbook, which is physically located in the store, and we're doing a lot of that at Walmart. In other words, Walmart might give you technology to walk through the aisles with in Absolutely. order to do this? And we're already doing some of that uh, with experiments in some of the U.S. stores. Really? And this is a very big deal for Walmart. Walmart has 200 million customer visits per week. If we can simply move the average customer experience, uh, call it to be 10% more satisfied, if we can have them come away with check sizes that are 10% more, uh, that to us really drives not only the overall business, but the metric where we're most challenged, which is same store sales. There's so much to talk about. Um, so Other prepared mind yeah, initiatives, I'll jump like right into that. Let's make sure we get that. through all those real quick. Yeah. Uh, virtualization and cloud computing, again, big phrase, big buzz phrases, but if you're sitting uh, on the side of Cisco, you're sitting at Dell, Hewlett Packard, Microsoft. You look at companies like VMware, which are some of the most innovative, interesting companies in the world. And the economics of storage, the economics of networking are being dramatically changed by virtualization. So we're what looking. Your, have you got some investments in that area now? What are and they? we have about a half dozen investments. What are some of the prime in, ones? Including an app named uh, company that uh, a couple of my partners did called Cloudera. Oh. Again, where we're trying to systematize what runs on the desktop or in the data center, but as Amazon has, I think, shown extremely well, what runs in the cloud, how do you address the privacy, the security, for not only large private networks that would exist in the cloud, but some of the smaller, more personal applications. And at Facebook, the, the cloud computing, the virtualization strategy, again, is extremely important as we try to manage the costs of storage per user, uh, as well as serving those users worldwide. So any other major prepared mind thing that you haven't mentioned? But those are the big ones? There are always a couple. I think the other, which I would mention, I think venture capitalists over the last five years have decided to bring a renewed focus to their firms. Uh, the days of the venture capital generalist are long gone. And we chose 10 years ago to open a London office and Kevin Camoli and a couple of my partners in London uh, who initiated the Playfish investment uh, have been with us now for 10 years. We opened a Chinese group of offices six years ago. They are performing extremely well and we've just launched an India effort about a year ago. Uh, my view for venture capitalists and serving entrepreneurs is if we can't help on day one with their global and international strategy, as well as their social application strategy, uh, we're not doing our job to help build companies. So that international component today uh, represents about 70% of our new deals. And so as I look at it, that is about right. Uh, I want to see overall about 25% of our worldwide investment activity coming from the U.S., 75% coming from Europe, Israel, China, and India. But even your U.S. investments have to have a global strategy from day one, you're saying. I mean, there's a no such absolutely. thing from you from now on in a, as a successful company that doesn't take a global view in some fashion. If a, if a new entrepreneur or company on day one is not taking a global view of the opportunity, a global view of how the social graph impacts their business, and not taking a view of what the impact of virtualization might be, we will not do that deal anywhere in the world. That's interesting. Um, let's, let's go to Facebook for, for a little bit here. You see, what got you interested in the first place? Just give us a quick chronology and, and, and what, what, how did you end up in this position as the biggest number two investor in Facebook after Mark Zuckerberg? Uh, well, it was 2003, 2004, and there were a couple social networks out there which many of us I, I look around, maybe there, there's some people who are too young to remember uh, those days, and that's a good thing. 
But uh, Friendster and several social networks were out there. We, uh, we looked at several. We didn't like any of them enough to say, let's invest. But in 2003 and 2004, there were two that really caught our eye. One was Flickr, and we looked very hard at Flickr. We wanted to invest in Flickr. And we also knew that there was a strategic group of uh, companies looking at Flickr, and indeed, uh, Yahoo ended up buying Flickr at about six times the price that we had offered the Flickr entrepreneurs. Today, when we uh, talk to Katarina, who is on the board of Etsy, or Stuart Butterfield, who is one of our new entrepreneurs, uh, we laugh because I still feel that would have been a better outcome, the Axel investment, than selling Flickr for $30 million to Yahoo. Uh, but Monday morning quarterbacking, of course, is very easy. Uh, there was also a social network called Tickle, which our Glam CEO, uh, Samir, introduced to us, and we did a lot of work on Tickle. We really saw through the social nature of their quizzes, there was a way to build a very strong viral business. And that led us to uh, find Facebook. A couple of our partners uh, did a great job of identifying this college network that was growing. We did active due diligence uh, on the campuses. On a Monday, uh, Mark and team came and presented uh, April 4th, 2005, as I recall. And that week, we ended up shaking hands on a deal uh, with Mark. Uh, and it was very clear, by the way, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, even then, uh, was an exceptional entrepreneur. So it was a combination of uh, pattern recognition and prepared mind. We had gone in knowing that there was an opportunity in social networking. We also wanted to find the right entrepreneur, and Mark, at that point, had six employees, and Mark had a sense of what social network and social applications would be like, at least for the college market. He always had a broader vision, but we knew at the very least he would build something that spread like wildfire through the college market, and we thought perhaps the high school market. There was uncertainty around how it might move out into other parts of the economy and other parts of the world, but there were a number of defining events along the way. Yeah, and Mark was already talking about that. And Mark time. was always talking about yeah. that. To, to his credit, and this is where Monday morning quarterbacking uh, really isn't relevant because over the years, we've talked about our portfolio and how do we drive really good portfolio performance. Uh, it is that rare combination of generally a deeply engaged, passionate, seminal entrepreneur attacking a market that is extraordinarily large. And then we try to connect the dots. So for years and to this day, I still get many questions, as Yuri does, about what is the Facebook business model? How do you monetize? How does this scale? Is it a flavor of the month? Even in 2005, Mark had conviction, and therefore we had conviction, that there were many, many things to worry about. But the ability to effectively monetize was not on certainly my top 10 list, and still is not. I worry about are we delivering great customer experiences? Are we building depth of experience? Is it still simple to use? Is the performance high uh, when you hit something on the site? Uh, does it take you to the right place? These are product issues that for us uh, really make the difference between a great experience and just a good experience. Uh, I was at the Facebook Q&A on Friday this past week, and almost all the questions from the Facebook employees are around customers, customer usage, how do we scale and remain large in terms of people, but at the same time deliver innovative, phenomenal engineering and product experiences for employees and therefore for our users. And I can say that with Shrep, Mark, Chris Cox, Sheryl Sandberg, uh, many, many others, I think we've built a team where innovation, 
product recruiting still sits at the heart of everything we do. Rather than continue to talk about Facebook just with you, I, if you don't mind, I would ask you to move one seat over. I'm going to bring up Yuri. I think we should have him in on whatever we talk about further about Facebook because it's fat more, going to be even more interesting to have both of you. So um, Yuri, come on up. And uh, Jim, I'm just going to talk to Yuri for a couple minutes and then we'll, you know, in, in fact, you may want to chime in even, uh, okay, all right, if that's the way you want it, okay. A uh, Russian deferring Russia, to a I don't U.S. Tell citizen. Guys what to do, you know that? Uh, this is not in the cards in the future. <laughs> so, 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 Yuri, first of all, Yuri, I think you should just tell us, you know, where did you come from? I mean, because, because honestly, you know, when, when, when we all heard some Russian guy was buying a couple percent of Facebook, it was like, what? You know? It, that seems crazy, you know? I mean, and then and after I've gotten to know you, I, I realize how uncrazy it actually is. But, um, you know, I think the existence of someone like you was a surprise to me. So I think you should surprise these people by talking a little bit about your, the, your background and how you got interested in social media and all the things you've done in it bef that led you up to the Facebook investment. Well, we, um, I basically started the company exactly 10 years ago and uh, started actually as a company. And I was actually the entrepreneur who was, in the, you know, attracting venture capital. And that's how the company got started. In fact, at that time, it was really an operational business. So we tried to run some, um, you know, internet companies, and some of them became very big, like uh, Mail.ru in Russia. Mail.ru, yeah. Um, and I was personally the CEO of the company for two years. So I started, like, on the other side of the equation, and uh, but slowly kind of realized that, you know, probably, you know, the way for me kind of to make the next step is really to become an investor. And... Um, I think about five years ago, you know, I, I, I made this switch and the company really became an investment company, uh, interestingly enough, staying as a company. So it doesn't have a fund structure and it has a permanent capital. And therefore, you know, we, I think, have a little more flexibility than some of the funds out there. And, uh, probably that allows us to make some decisions, you know, faster. But okay, but, but talk about how, how you got into social media investing and, and, and what you've done specifically in that arena in the well, past We few basically years. started to invest in social networks around 2007. And uh, before Facebook invested in few um, pretty successful social network in our part of the world, uh, two social networks in Russia and one in Poland in particular, and uh, they are still dominant in, uh, in the area, which is sort of surprising given, you know, the, the scale of Facebook. Contacta being the leader in Russia, that you're, Contacta, you're, uh, you're, you're the biggest investor in Contacta, right? Yes, yeah. and the only investor. You're the only outside investor, yeah. Right. Yeah. Does um, that mean, how much of it do you own? I mean, do you own it? Do you... Uh, do well, you we usually don't... don't disclose the percentages, but I mean, it's a significant uh, ownership, but not a controlling stake. So, um, and that's uh, how we've gotten to understand that, you know, social media is, uh, is really a big trend and probably an overwhelming trend. As, as Jim mentioned, you know, when they talk to entrepreneurs, they don't really invest if there is no sort of social element in, in, in the game. And uh, we kind of came to that conclusion early on, and you know, that's how Facebook investment came about. But also you observed certain things in your companies in Russia and elsewhere that led you to have more confidence about, you know, the, in your opinion, the, 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 that it wasn't as risky to put money into 200 million initially into Facebook at a $10 billion valuation, which you did, which in some ways actually was the highest valuation Facebook had ever gotten, considering the Microsoft thing was so tied into a business deal that really wasn't, they, they invested in order to get the business deal as much as anything. But um, so why did you feel that you weren't taking some kind of huge risk to put 200 million in a 10 billion valuation? Well, Facebook focus uh, at the time and probably a year or two prior to our investment was really international and, you know, scaling the company. 
And as Jim mentioned, the you know monetization was not really top priority uh, at the time. Uh, that was not so for the networks that we invested before that. And these companies, they did not have to scale globally. They were sort of much sort of smaller operations, and they focused on monetization, uh, interestingly enough, earlier than Facebook. And uh, sort of that, you know, uh, brought us to this concept that Facebook has a tremendous monetization opportunity uh, even though it's not really tapping into a lot of them right now, but it's sort of still really a significant untapped potential. Spe yeah, specifically how was, say, Contacta monetizing in a way that Facebook was not that you thought it might be able to later? Well, I think Contacta was probably the first social network globally to monetize uh, applications in a big way. And they really, you know, introduced a tax on all revenue uh, that is flowing through applications and for them it's it's a very significant source of revenue it's it's a very significant percentage of what they're making applications yes what do you mean charge for installing a game or something no, no, like they, they charge you know all the revenue that's flowing through application through their own payment system that they introduced and that's another thing that they've done early on is really launching their own payment system and kind of really making applications use this payment system uh, for their own purposes. Well, virtual goods is also something they've done quite well too, right? Um, yes, yes. I, I mean, if you look at you know other companies, uh, you know, Tencent in China is really almost like charging monthly fees uh, to a big, significant portion of its users uh, for value-added services. And I mean, looking at this you know, space globally, we thought that, you know, there will come a time when, you know, Facebook in particular will, you know, tap into those different streams of revenue. And, um, but at the same time, because we are very long-term investors, you know, we are prepared to see it through, you know, uh, it doesn't matter how long it takes. And now you own, you've bought a lot more Facebook stock since that initial purchase directly from the company. How much more have you acquired? Well, we, again, don't usually talk about numbers, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a few hundred million dollar investment. Um, Beyond the 200 million? Yes. So you've spent a 200 lot. million plus a few hundred million on Facebook already. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But, but uh, the... Um, Actually, the fact of the matter is that we are doing something very complementary to what Jim is doing, which is late-stage investments. So this tends to be a sort of bigger checks, inevitably. And Jim was saying that, you know, IPO market is, you know, kind of became tougher, and there are fewer companies that are actually uh, acquiring smaller businesses. And that's where we saw sort of our opportunity by basically coming in and sort of... Uh, in a way, you know, doing an IPO supplement that would allow early investors and early employees to cash out and still the company to continue on the course for the next few years until such time that it decides to go public or get sold. Right. Now, you have a theory, though, that the Internet worldwide is kind of homogenizing or becoming more similar. Just talk about that a little bit. What, what do you mean when you talk about you know, the, the Internet's becoming sort of the same globally? Well, I mean, uh, the Facebook is probably the best example. The, the uh, you know, the global reach of Facebook, and um, I think it now operates in uh, more than 100 languages. And, um, you know, we sort of, since we've made the significant investment, we sort of tend to monitor what's going on on a country-by-country -country basis. And in each country where Facebook is really catching up, you know, we see the same pattern. And it's the same product. Basically, it gets translated, and uh, there are not really significant adjustment. So that means that you know the uh, you know there are a number of really universal products globally that cross you know cultures and cross languages. You know, Google is another example, but Facebook is really um, you know the business that clearly showed that you know social graph and, you know, so, social is, is, is really very, I mean, in a way, it's, uh, it's almost like one global social graph 
that uh, that exists out there. Right. Well, you were also talking. We were talking last night about how virtual goods really got started by Tencent in China, and now it's sort of spreading to be a global business. So, and there's other examples of things coming from one place that just happened to work, and if they work, they're pretty much adopted everywhere. And, and Tencent, of course, is a fascinating pioneer in a lot of ways. Um, well, that brought us to our second investment, which is Zynga, which is really... Zynga, yeah. You just put is, uh, how much? 140 million? Um, we actually led, <laughs> we led the round that was 180 million, and we provided the majority of the capital there, so it's yeah. a pretty significant That's check. That's a lot, yeah. But it was also driven by realization that this, uh, you know, virtual goods and virtual payment market is uh, going to come to the United States and to the Western world to the extent it basically caught up in China in the last 10 years. Well, you know, um, well, let's, let's talk specifically about Facebook's future. Um, you know, Mike Schrepfer was here talking yesterday um, about the idea that, you know, Facebook increasingly wants to be infrastructure and that the long-term vision is for Facebook Connect and what's now called the Stream API, you know, content outside of Facebook going into Facebook and Facebook content going outside. That's really what Facebook's future is, is thought to be inside the company. Um, but I guess one of the questions is, you know, I guess, well, you two seem to both be, I sure, believers in, in the, the either. You've got to kind of have a certain ubiquity for that to happen. Do you, how big do you both think Facebook can be in this infrastructural way that it's aiming at? Let, I'd like to hear both of you talk about that briefly. Yeah, you can start, Jim. Go ahead. How big can Facebook be, Jim? Uh, I think that if you look out many years, and I think market timing uh, for a venture capitalist is always the most challenging a part of the business because uh, often things, of course, take much longer to really get to critical mass than you think. But once they hit that inflection point, they grow very dramatically. I think our goal for Facebook uh, is certainly uh, over time to have a billion or so users, uh, to have most, if not all, of the important web applications be part of the platform in Facebook Connect. To have an ecosystem where you mean web applications like eBay, Amazon, absolutely, kind of Walmart.com, Walmart, right. Dell.com, uh, all of these, uh, I believe, will have very the things significant we do on the web. Yeah, right. Facebook yeah. implementations. I would hope that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of software companies, third-party companies, media companies that are building win-win partnerships with Facebook through the platform and connect, and that's something that Shrep and his team are really focused on from a plumbing standpoint. Our real belief is Facebook and Facebook Connect uh, as a platform can provide really unique transparency for many of the third-party publishers, software developers, young entrepreneurs, commerce vendors out there. And so how big does this become? Uh, our expectations are very large. We don't think in raw revenue numbers, but in terms of some of the metrics, uh, we are incredibly impatient to get where we need to go long-term, but very patient around focusing again on product engineering, recruiting, and building a group of all-stars to enable these kinds of third-party apps to thrive. So Yuri, is a billion uh, where you'd like to see it go? Well, I think it's a very realistic uh, number. Um, uh, as it turns out, the company that is building itself on a social graph uh, tends almost to be a natural monopoly. And it's sort of the way I see it right now and the trends that we see in many countries, it's almost sort of inevitable that you know, if there will be like the company in social area, uh, this will probably be Facebook. I I'm not saying that there will not be smaller companies in, in certain countries. Well, considering you're the investor in the smaller yes. com companies in, uh, in like seven uh, different but, uh, countries. At the, at the same time, I think uh, th there will be just few companies that will be able to, you know, produce products that will be uh, comparable to Facebook product long term. So I think that. Uh, Facebook will tend to dominate in, uh, in many markets, and it's already dominating in something like 40 countries. 
So therefore, I think as you know, internet will penetrate more and more people, including mobile. You know, in some countries it will be just mobile, which will drive it. Um, I think uh, you know, billing users is sort of an intermediate step. And, and Yuri does pay close attention to this stuff. For example, I hope I can say this, but you told me something very interesting last night, which was that Facebook is no longer turned off in China, which uh, has been the case since last June. And I think, from all I knew, it was still turned off. But they're turning on, you know, on, on Facebook and having this challenge with Google. But that. Um, I want to get to some audience questions. It says here we don't have too many more minutes, so I don't want to um, waste our time. But I guess I should ask you both, since you're, we have time? OK. If anybody would be pushing Facebook to IPO, it would be you two guys. And that's a question a lot of people are asking. When is Facebook going to IPO? So I'd like to hear both of you answer that question. Well, I'm Especially happy to, you. I'm happy to announce we are in no way planning uh, a near-term IPO. Uh, and again, Wait, what is near term? Near near term, 2010. And I don't speak for the company. It won't on happen these in issues. 2010. No, it won't. And Mark Zuckerberg and Cheryl and Shrep and the team are the ones who really drive this. But we are simply not focused on the IPO as an event. Uh, we are focused right now on going out and attracting phenomenal technical and product talent as well as business talent. We like the fact that we're private. I'm on several public boards, and I can promise you that you, we spend more time in accounting, litigation, and Sarbanes-Oxley updates than often on product strategy. And for Facebook right now, it really is all about product strategy, getting platform right, getting Facebook Connect right, and getting the culture right and the yeah. teamwork. Okay. So those are the goals. There will not be an IPO in 2010. And beyond that, we take one year as it comes. Okay, Yuri, so you are the guy who has by far put more cash money into Facebook than anyone else on the planet. What's your exit strategy? Well, as I said, we um, really have a permanent capital. And we don't have to return money to you know our investors. And therefore, we sort of have, from that standpoint, an unlimited patience. And um, I think it's very important sort of to follow the vision through much more than, you know, anything else. And we are definitely not the ones who are pushing for anything because, I mean, it's up to the board and management to, to make that call. Isn't it surprising that this Russian guy has this point of view that he has about these guys? I think, I think he's really interesting. Um, the one last thing I want to ask you both, and then I want to ask, let questions come in from everybody. You know, social media, for all of its charms, has a huge problem, which is that its CPMs are horrible, and uh, that really it hasn't fundamentally found a monetization strategy as an industry uh, in general. Um, meanwhile, Google continues to be extraordinarily efficient as an ad medium and drawing all this revenue, etc. Can social media ever get close to that kind of efficiency, Jim? And I'd like Yuri to address this too. You know, how you see the advertising working in Facebook and other businesses in social space? I don't believe that social networks or Facebook will ever, ever approach Google in terms of its advertising efficiency. I would say that Google is the most efficient advertising system uh, it, ever invented. And I don't think we're going to see something like that again. That has positives, and as we heard yesterday, potential negatives for publishers, commerce sites, etc. cetera. Uh, but we think that it's not really the CPM rate for Facebook that really matters. Uh, we believe there is a very clear long-term monetization strategy, and we're basically on that path. We are you not mean like currency and stuff like that that's not advertising? Or you mean other kinds of advertising that's more efficient? There will always be other kinds of advertising that are more efficient in terms of how traditional media might measure advertising. But Facebook is a multifaceted model even today, whether it's virtual goods, uh, some future payment opportunities, uh, working with third parties to help distribute their product. I believe, if we're successful, that Facebook will have an extremely diverse 
set of revenue streams that will make it quite durable. Again, we're not going to get all of it right. There is testing experimentation that needs to occur, but I certainly believe Facebook can provide great value to the Walmarts of the world. At the same time, it can provide great value for software developers, for media companies that want to connect uh, with their audience, uh, Marvel Entertainment, and which is now part of Disney. Uh, this is one, you were on the board of Marvel, you one of your big investments. Yeah. And when you're doing an Iron Man 2 release in May, there is absolutely no reason you shouldn't be spending more in terms of building audience with the Marvel geeks around the world than you are in terms of full page ads in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. The fact is there is a recognition that is occurring both on Main Street and in many of the media companies that an effective Facebook and social advertising and marketing campaign, in fact, long term, is far more effective than anything else that can be done. Okay. Okay. We're going to go to audience. Yeah. Esther. We have just five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. I, I mean this politely because I'm a big fan, but it, it deserves comment, which is why does Facebook, which actually has very nice fine-grained privacy controls, keep screwing up in how it does all the stuff around privacy? <laughs> I think you should take that. Yuri, Yuri, Yuri should take that. I'd like to just hear Yuri say something. Well, I, I actually think that the... Uh, you know, one of the main features of the Facebook revolution was uh, privacy settings. I mean, Jim mentioned a few networks that they were, they were looking at previously, and uh, the big differentiating factor was privacy settings. There were many open social networks, and if you look at the privacy settings, you know, Facebook is as good as it gets. I mean, everything needs to be compared uh, and relative. So to the extent that you know, privacy is actually becoming a big issue on the internet, Facebook is trying to address it. It might not always be ideal and you know, making maybe some mistakes, but I think uh, their, their business model is based on privacy. So to the extent that they, can able, you know, they will be able to achieve it, they will be successful. Uh, Adam Lashinsky with Fortune Magazine. Oh. I've heard of you. Hi, David. Uh, Adam Lashinsky with Fortune Magazine. Jim, would you elaborate on the comment that David attributed to you that Facebook is now turned on in China? No, I turned, attributed to Yuri. Excuse me. Is it true, Jim? <laughs> uh, I believe it is true. Uh, but I will also say I believe that uh, some of the data we all heard yesterday about Google uh, not filtering in China, there's enough noise and there's, there are enough issues relative to privacy that blanket statements around China and generalizations are extremely difficult to make based on the data that I see. But there was some kind of a change regarding Facebook in the last few weeks. Yes. Because Facebook was absolutely turned off in China from June of last year until the last few weeks. The only people who got it were through proxies. Okay, one more question? Anybody got one more question? Nobody's daring to ask another question? All questions have been answered. Uh, well, thank you so much. Right? Thank you both. Thank you both.